Hello there everybody and welcome back to another episode of Anecologist Plays and Sisters, the Humankind Odyssey. Now, where we left off last week was right here on the beach and Lucy was taking a stroll along the beach and she has come across this flotilla of otters. Now, the otters we have around in Africa today, the freshwater otters, uh, so Africa we've got the Cape Clawless otter and we've got the Spotted Neck otter, they don't do this whole flotilla thing where they hang around drifting around on their backs like they do here. But the sea otters that you find in North America would, for example, do that. Now the otters are not happy with our presence, so we're just going to move away. Anyway, so we were, I was just taking a stroll along here. We are going to go to the other side of the beach now. That'll be the western edge of the beach. And this past week I've been thinking about this beach environment. And about the kelp that was lying on the beach. And we're going to see some kelp again in a moment. Now, what I do enjoy about this game, and there are many things I do enjoy about this game, but one thing is that this game is a representation of the whole of Africa kind of rolled into one. So, what have we got? We've got some more otters over there. They're swimming along. Okay, but we started in the forests, in, the, in this case in the map, that's in the eastern part of the map, and that represents kind of the Central African, East African forest that would have existed there. And then we move into the savannah ecosystem, which kind of represents the drying of Africa, or the climate at some point in history as well, during the Middle Miocene, I think it was, or the Late Miocene. And we then moved through the desert, which represents, in the case of the Velvicia that we have, where is the Velvicia? It was right over here a moment ago. In case of plants like the Velvicia that's growing along the beach, somewhere, that represents the southern edge of Africa, along with things like the aloe over here, but aloes go kind of everywhere. But then we end up here along the beach, which is the east coast of southern Africa. Because kelp only occurs in certain environments. And we're going to encounter some kelp probably again in a moment as we run along here. There we go. Here we have some more kelp. Let me just drop my stick. And there we go. So kelp, quite awesome. It's a massive, massive algae species that usually occurs slightly offshore. Now, of course, if you've got certain species, they are able to survive a little bit deeper. In Southern Africa, we've got Laminaria pallida, which is a species that can survive in, meat, in water that's about 30 meters deep. So that's quite deep for kelp. The majority of kelp species, however, prefer to be a little bit shallower. So they would be in the just offshore here, just past these rocks, or even in, these, in this cove over here, they also would be. Now, they survive only really in cold waters, in, in Places around the world you'll find in uh, North America, you'll find it. If you're looking at uh, in Africa, you'll only really find it along the south coast, southwest coast of the continent. There where there is colder water. And in particular, one thing that it needs is what we call nutrient upwelling. Now, nutrient upwelling is when you have got very nutrient-rich water that's brought to the surface, most often due to the action of wind. So wind blowing from land over here into the ocean and that kind of pushes water away but at the same time pulls water from deeper down and brings it to the surface and that water when it comes in from deeper down brings a lot of nutrients and when it does that oh, we are in a new little environment but we already have got everything around here okay we're just going to conquer our fear way over there but when it pulls nutrients from the bottom there or from the when it pulls water from the bottom it also brings with it a whole lot of nutrients and the nutrients there will fuel the growth of things like the kelp uh, or algae overall because algae don't have roots to take up nutrients so they get the nutrients from whatever nutrients is suspended in the water or carried along with it and this nutrient upwelling is therefore extremely important because without it it wouldn't be able to actually survive they wouldn't have a lot of nutrients and they wouldn't grow as well well, there is another episode of An Ecologist Place when I played Subnautica when I also talked about that a little bit and I will link that in the description as well. So if you want to have a look, feel free to pop in there, have a look at that quite old video. It's more, it's about a year old now already, 
But in there, I did talk about nutrient upwelling, as you would observe it in Subnautica as well. We're just heading along the coast here. We're just going to go and have a look at the uh, landmarks along here, and then we're heading home again, back to the savannah slash desert environment. Now, there is also a meteorite, or supposed to be a meteorite, in this along the beach, but it seems I'm not able to actually see that because it hasn't landed yet. And that's probably because I haven't looked at the, or discovered the correct landmark. Just looking at anything we can see here, nothing to see. So these meteorites only appear once you discover certain landmarks. And they're tied to those landmarks. And I haven't been able, I haven't spotted the landmark, I haven't discovered the landmark that gives you the beach uh, meteorite. I think there's also two other ones that I am also missing. So I will have to have a look at that at some point. Oh, we're right in the conquer zone. Yay! Okay, so as I've mentioned before, the home range that we are constantly expanding like that would just be the area within which our troop would move. Now, if it were to be very realistic, the troop would move all over the place without my input and would kind of move within the zone that's currently their home range. In this case, we're just kind of expanding where the areas we know and that's kind of the idea here so let's see what is this landmark that we are discovering here it's something along the beach obviously and this is uh, mussels beach okay makes sense because there are lots and lots of mussels around here now these mussels are in the mightiless genus and uh, there are quite a few species they're known as black mussels uh, quite a few species around, uh, including the black mussel in South Africa and then the Mediterranean mussel, which comes from, well, you guessed it, the Mediterranean area. Now, Mediterranean mussels are actually quite invasive, and they will take over environments quite a lot. Uh, in South Africa, for example, lots of our beaches, especially along the west coast, with oh, another conquer zone, oh my word, uh, especially in areas where there is nutrient upwelling, the Mediterranean mussels do extremely well, and to some extent, they actually oust the indigenous species, so they replace the indigenous species, which obviously, if you're looking from a biodiversity point of view, you do not want. You don't want an exotic species taking over the environment that was... Oh, hello. You don't want them taking over an environment that was... <laughs> you know, a niche that was filled by an indigenous species. I was wondering what on earth is right in front of us here. Didn't re didn't think to check that, oh, are they maybe otters? But in any case, there we go. So otters around here as well. May as well just spot them. And then we are in the conquer zone, basically. So let's do that. Oh, bash another one. Okay. Now let's conquer our fear. Okay, so there is another landmark right over there, which of course is where we are heading now. But that Mediterranean mussel, oh, and here we go, here's the Velvicia again that we had talked about previously as well. Now in South Africa, there are, there's a bird known as the Black Oyster Catcher. If you're from the Northern Hemisphere, you most likely know the, or well, if you are from Eurasia, you would know the Eurasian Oyster Catcher. I saw my first Eurasian oyster catcher beginning of this year when my wife and I did a survey uh, for an environmental impact assessment. We saw one which is uh, out of range, it doesn't really occur in southern Africa, but there was a vagrant one that popped up in South Africa and has been staying here for well, basically a year now, it never returned to Europe uh, during the course of the winter period, where it should have, it should have migrated back, it didn't, it's still around apparently here in in the Western Cape of South Africa. And anyway, we uh, saw that species for the first time, which was extremely exciting. Exciting, And I have been wanting to see that Eurasian oyster catcher well, basically my entire life, uh, since I've been birding, which is, oh my goodness, I started in 1997. So 25 years I've been doing some birding now. But the black oyster catcher that we do have in South Africa it, well, it's doing better now, but it was actually very endangered due to a variety of reasons. Amongst other things, people driving with off-road vehicles along the shore 
which crushes the eggs and kills the chicks because they nest all, all along the shore here. But they're eating mussels. Uh, they call them an oyster catcher, but they should actually be called a mussel eater because they, they eat mussels. Uh, so not really eating or catching oysters. And besides, how would you catch an oyster? Which oyster doesn't move. But anyway, uh, but those black oyster catchers, when the Mediterranean mussels started invading, they actually did better. Because the Mediterranean mussels grew quite quickly and grew quite densely uh, and they grew faster than the indigenous black mussels that the oyster catchers used to eat. And the uh, Mediterranean mussels also have got a weaker muscle that keeps the mussels shut. <laughs> so there's a muscle that uh, keeps the shells of the mussels shut and in the Mediterranean mussel that muscle is uh, actually weaker than in the indigenous black mussel, making it easier for things like oyster catchers to open them up. And as a result, oh, those scorpions, so these would be the death stalker scorpions again from North Africa. Although in South Africa, we would have the Parabuthus scorpions as well, with their quite large tails and quite small pincers. Now these ones, uh, they kind of resemble a little bit more the uh, Opistophthalmus, which would be the burrowing scorpions with the medium-sized tail and pincers. They're not quite as deadly, but really deadly scorpions would have massively thick tails and tiny, tiny pincers because they rely on their venom to kill the prey that they catch. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here, but the because of the Mediterranean mussels actually invading South Africa's coastline, there where the Mediterranean mussels were, the black oyster catchers actually had a better breeding success rate. So they were raising their chicks easier, more easily, than in areas where the Mediterranean mussels were not. And that's one weird case where an exotic species or an alien invasive animal in this case actually helped a threatened species to do better. And now they are, I think, vulnerable rather than uh, endangered. So that's some good news, but then again, you know, it is still an invasive species and it could in some cases replace some of the indigenous species growing along our shore. This year, the last shelter oasis. I guess we are supposed to end the game somewhere along here, and then this would be the last shelter. A typical cave system, or cave entrance at least, that our ancestors may have used. If you're looking at humans like the Bushmen, the Sand for example, they would, in areas where there were caves, they would use them quite a lot, because this is a very nice shelter. I mean, you don't get wet when it rains, you can only be attacked from that side, predators can only come in from that side, you can't be flanked, and you know, this is, just makes sense. Now, our hominid, however, is really tired, so we're just going to get onto this rock over here, take a quick nap, and we'll be back in a moment. Now, I must say, one of the many things that I do love about this game as well is the fact, or at least the ambiance, and if you're in the cave here, and I'll turn the volume up a bit now, it almost sounds echoey, it sounds like you are in a cave. You can almost hear the wind howling outside. I really, really enjoy this. I appreciate the fact that they, they did that. Um, and then so as soon as you're outside the cave, it's, uh, you know, you're on the outside again. It sounds completely different. But there we go. We have basically reached the edge of the map. We can't go past that uh, point over there. I think there is one last uh, oasis at the bottom there, or landmark that we have to discover. Nothing else left on this side to discover. Uh, we've already been in all those areas and way in the back. That is where our current settlement is. So we will be heading back there shortly. But we are just going to go down here and see if there are any landmarks to discover at the bottom here. But let's head on out in that direction. And then we should probably evolve. And probably, I guess we should be able to make it to the next species, which is Australopithecus africanus, which I believe is the town child. And that species was discovered, or properly described, from specimens discovered in South Africa. And in particular, the town child comes from the northwest province in South Africa, uh, so at Tahung. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we reach that species, or oh, probably in the next episode then. But for now, let's quickly conquer our fear, and this is probably going to be one of the last times that we conquer our fear. It seems there is no landmark. 
discover here at the edge of the world. So what I'm just going to do now is buff myself with some aloes so that we don't get sunstroke or so we don't get heat stroke. Again, just removing it, the leaves, and using it, the sap. Now, aloes really are amazing plants, medicinally used for a variety of reasons, but it's extremely, extremely bitter. You won't just go and eat an aloe. And I'll never forget a few years ago when I was lecturing some of my students in the Game Ranch Management course, what I did was I had never actually taken a piece of aloe and, you know, licked it. And so what happened is I was talking about I was talking about how to identify a certain species of aloe known as the Kranz aloe. And while describing that, I said it is probably very bitter. And I took a piece of leaf and I licked it and immediately regretted the fact that I licked it. And then I was like, ah, this is horrible. And then my students refused to believe that it really could be that bad. So the first one decided to also break off a piece of leaf and lick that and again immediately regretted it which just prompted the next one to say that no it can't be that bad and you know break off and lick and eventually the whole class basically broke off pieces of leaf of an aloe and licked it and all of them pretty much regretted it immediately it's not something you really want to do but it is amazing as a medicinal plant not as something to eat but you can process it somehow i don't know how probably like magic you can process it to make uh, sweets from it which i have had i have had aloe sweets before but i think you need to add so much sugar just to make it palatable that <laughs> it's probably not very healthy but aloes and plants in the aloe family i'm not sure what family name that is now it used to be uh, in the Liliaceae family, then it got split. The whole Liliaceae plant family got split into a variety of different families, including uh, Asphodelaceae. Uh, then it got changed to Aloaceae, then it was Xanthoroaceae, then it went back to uh, Asphodelaceae. I think we're currently still on it being in the Asphodel uh, family, the Asphodelaceae. But the aloe family, a lot of them are medicinal. And in, here in our garden, we have got one known as Bulbini which is, well, the common name is Copifa. And that plant you can use for all kinds of skin ailments. If you've got a cut, if you've got uh, acne, if you have you know, anything that happens can go wrong with your skin, a, a burn, for example, you rub that on there and it heals you know, quite quickly. And the aloes, same type of principle, where in this case we are rubbing it on ourselves as sun protection. Now, I wouldn't just go around rubbing aloe juice on me when and think that I'm going to be protected against the the sun uh, but certainly protection and healing of wounds or cuts and stuff like that definitely it would be able to to help you with that but we are basically leaving the beach now I'm just going to triple check here that there are no landmarks that we had not discovered nothing there nothing there nothing up there so Back to our settlement. That is where we are heading. And, well, I will meet you there in a moment. Well, we are getting closer to the settlement again. We have reached the savannah, finally. <laughs> I got sidetracked so many times on the way here. But anyway, uh, and immediately as we start heading here away from the desert environment, grasses become more abundant because here there's more predictable summer rainfall and as a result grasses start to do a little bit better than it did in the desert where rainfall was very unpredictable and a lot of the moisture along the desert environment at least here in South Africa in the Namib desert a lot of the moisture that the plants get and the animals get are actually in the form of fog that rolls in from the ocean that is uh, where a lot of plants will get their uh, moisture that they need in order to survive but here however with the higher rainfall uh, we are you know we have more grasses growing as well so basically at our settlement there we go hello hominids we have returned little ones hello family everybody just kind of standing around this is a very jolly patrolly family anyway let's go in here chill a bit in our cave and let's see so if we look here at our skill tree, basically, 
they, we really have fleshed it out quite nicely. There are some that we, are, we haven't gotten yet, and we'll probably get that in, you know, as we can continue playing. But there are also three mutations here that are currently in our babies. Able to concentrate a little bit better, able to tolerate climatic variations, and uh, to be buffed against injuries. So we are just going to change generations so that those become permanent within the population as, they, as the babies reach adults, adulthood, and then we are going to evolve and hopefully get to Australopithecus africanus. So I'll be back with you in a moment. Okay, well, I guess here we go. We are ready to evolve. Let's have a look if we go from Lucy into the town child. It looks like we are still Lucy, I'm afraid. <laughs> Rat. But here on the edge of the savannah, we are going to then call it a day. Thank you very much for joining me again, everybody. Really, really appreciate it. Hope you learned something new. And if there's anything you want me to do with the little hominids over here, please do let me know. Until next time, stay safe and I will see you all soon.